from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. But as we prepare to continue to hear God's word this day, let us pray. God of life, open our hearts and our minds to your presence among us that we may rightly hear your word for us this day. Amen. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have to admit that this is one of those weeks that my sermon was pointing one way and was pretty much done, and then halfway through the week, it had to be changed. Something happened Wednesday that made me think about what did Scripture have to offer us this day. And I'll admit that I stand up here, and I said this before at my previous church, I am tired of standing in the pulpit and having to make sense of tragedy. I pray this day for those faith leaders who have to stand in those places in Florida and offer good news. But as I reflected on the passages that were in our lectionary for this first Sunday and Lent, there's something that stuck out to me. Something that happened after the school shooting Wednesday. The same thing that happens every time. People went to their sides. Social media erupted with post after post, retweet after retweet, sharing of articles, pictures, graphs, memes galore. And I scrolled through and watched as each camp made ready. But all I could think was how, for most of us, most of us on social media, well, we only follow who we want to follow. So we only read, for the most part, on social media, our camp, with a few posts thrown in from other camps. And I couldn't help but think of this psalm, Psalm 25. Do not let me be put to shame, the psalmist says. Do you hear the humanness in that? The brokenness. Do not let me be put to shame. All right, God, the psalmist appears to be saying, I am laying it in your hands. Do not let me be put to shame. But what we don't hear is this. Do not let me be put to shame. I'm just going to give it to you. Now, this is what we hear. This is what we hear. Do not let me be put to shame. And how can you make this happen, God? How can I not be shamed? Let those other people 
be shamed. You can vindicate me, God, by allowing those other people to be shamed, to be wrong. This week, we created this, those other people, and we each have in mind who those other people are, all of us, myself included. We did this. In the midst of tragedy, again. And sadly, it looks like we'll do it again, and again, and again. And nothing comes from it. But I read through this psalm and thought, man, maybe this psalmist does have something else to offer us. For a while, the psalmist does say this. You do get this sense that the psalmist desires God to come to her aid, to lift her up, to allow her not to be put to shame. And for those against her, to, well, to get it. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. That's just the first few verses. As I continue to reflect on this psalm and did look at some of all the camps that were forming on social media, I came across the post of one of my friends, Reverend Ricky James, who serves at St. Luke's. And his post was kind of about this, but there's a part in the middle to me where he spoke the words of this psalmist. And this is what he said. He says, it has become an almost universal ritual to respond to tragedies by offering our thoughts and prayers. These words seem to instinctively arise from our lips, he says, perhaps because we've been taught to say them or because we don't know what else to say. He says, in the wake of yet another horrific act of violence, again visited upon our most vulnerable there has been much debate about the insufficiency of simply offering thoughts and prayers. He says, I understand and very much sympathize with the concern that this is insufficient to face the challenges of our day. And this is the part that really resonated with me. He says, I was raised as a Christian in Mississippi and learned that when we want to get out of a difficult or awkward conversation, we should say, I'll pray about that. And then we move on with no intention of actually praying it. It's a form of polite dishonesty, like, bless their heart. We're just ready to move on and not ready to actually pray. He says, I think that's why it rings so hollow to me when I hear the phrase thoughts and prayers. He does say, I believe thoughts and prayers are necessary but that we should be honest when we offer that phrase. Actually think and pray about this. But be careful when you do this, he says. And this is where I hear the psalmist kind of entering in. Be careful when you do this, he says. In my experience, when I talk to God, God has a tendency to talk back. Not audibly, but often by bringing to my mind things Jesus said. Things like, blessed are the peacemakers. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies and pray for them. Put up your sword. Of course, he says, what any of this means for our contemporary discussion on the causes and solutions to violence is certainly up for debate, and we must have this debate Smarter people than me will have much better solutions than I could offer. So yes, he says, offer your thoughts and prayers, but be genuine about it. And let those prayers inform your thoughts. He goes on to say that his thoughts and prayers are for the victims and their families, that his thoughts and prayers are for the nation, psychologists, legislatures, teachers, counselors, law enforcement, and gun owners. 
And then he adds, and as much as it pains me, my thoughts and prayers are for the perpetrators of violence. Jesus told me to do this, and I try to make a habit of listening to him. So offer thoughts and prayers, but be genuine about it. And let those prayers inform your thoughts. This is what we hear in our psalmist today, offering up a genuine prayer, but wanting, desiring to be formed by it, striving to listen to God's word, even while offering beginning words of frustration and fear and concern and thoughts of his own welfare. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And then, then this is what we find. Teach me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Make me to know, the psalmist begs. Lead me in your truth. I wait. I wait to know, I wait to be taught, I wait to be led. May your truth guide me. Now the psalmist frequently exhort God to teach them, and there's a confidence you find in the book of Psalms that this will happen, that God will indeed offer God's guidance and wisdom, that God will not leave us alone just to figure it all out. And God as teacher, especially in this psalm, is connected to God as Savior. That somehow, through opening ourselves up to God's teaching and to God's wisdom, opening ourselves up to God's guidance, that this, that this is how we will be saved. Wednesday, we entered into our Lenten season a season all about opening ourselves up to God, clearing away the clutter in our lives and spending intentional time with God so that we may indeed hear God's truth for us. And Lent always begins with the same passage. Jesus and his 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. Now this year, the lectionary calendar falls in the Gospel of Mark, and Mark's telling of the story is only two verses long. Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit, and for 40 days he was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. That's all we get in Mark. We don't get the bigger picture of what this temptation entailed as we do in the other Gospels. But we do know that this was an intentional time apart following Jesus' baptism and bef before he entered into his own ministry. Forty days of Jesus living into his humanity. You see, in the wilderness passage, Jesus is much like our psalmist. He is fully human, meaning he is fully tempted. His body needs everything our body needs in every possible way. Food, water, shelter, rest. In the other gospel passages, we see that Jesus is tempted with power in every possible way. Will he give in to this desire for power that gives the illusion that we can somehow rise above the limitations of our humanity? Or will he lean into God's strength? These are the questions Jesus and his humanity must answer before he begins his earthly ministry. So he steps apart for 40 days to listen, to question, Will I rely on my own strength? Will I believe the world and what the world offers as strength and power? Or will I lean into God, rely on God, 
listen to God for guidance, for strength, for support, for wisdom. And yes, it's too easy for us to think, oh, well, this is Jesus. So, but we shouldn't take this too lightly because we believe Jesus was fully human. So Jesus fully struggled with all of those temptations. Both of these passages, well, they name our brokenness. They name our human nature. They name our fragility. And they force us to ask, am I living in my own, into my own strength? Am I trying to live into the world's strength? Or am I living into God's? You'll see I put the title in there as trust and was leaning more of just talking about the trust it took for Jesus and this psalmist. But as I reflected on that, that is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about faith. The trust that we must have in God to even lean into God's strength. Faith requires a lot of trust because what Jesus learned not just in the wilderness, but his life played out. What we learn in Jesus is that God's strength is displayed in weakness. God's strength was most triumphantly demonstrated in the cross. It is in defeat, in death, in humiliation that God did God's most miraculous and transformative work. It is in Jesus, God relinquishing God's own power to become humble, to serve, to be present, to be tempted in every way possible, to be one of us, that we are able to see who God is. So think back to our psalm. The psalmist asks to be taught to be led in the way, to know. And then towards the end, the psalmist reminds us of this way, of who God is. That our God is the God of covenant and compassion. That, com that companionship, compassion, and loving kindness are the fundamental characters of our God. So we begin our first Sunday in Lent, remembering that our very real God entered into the messiness of our lives and offered us an opportunity to change. A little change that maybe has the possibility of entering into the messiness of the world and creating bigger change but it does require us to trust, to lean into God, to trust in God's strength and remember that God's vision of power and strength is not always ours and certainly not the world's. So over the next five Sundays in Lent, we will look at various passages that help us reflect on this very real presence of God in Jesus Christ how Jesus Christ entered into the messiness of humanity and said that transformation is possible. Amen.